All right, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Scott Williams. She works for NASA. And I know that's why you guys are all here because you want to know <laughs> about NASA and uh, what she does. And um, she's a, a manager for application support, correct? And um, uh, what did you want to do? Uh, wait for the your presentation to be over to ask questions, to answer questions, or um, uh, oh. Yeah, if if we have questions during the presentation, I'll I'll do my best to entertain them. I will probably need someone to let me know okay. if there are questions, or if they want to put something in the chat, that's fine, and and you can just um, okay. What I'm going to do since we have a large crowd today, I'm going to wait. I'm going to uh, take care of the chat log. Right, I'm going to uh, take it off. And when you're done, you guys can uh, post your, your questions because um, um, I don't want to keep navigating the chat uh, with 50 kids. So um, we'll wait till after you're done and then you guys can ask all the questions you want to ask, okay? Yeah. All right. So I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Scott Williams from NASA. Hold on to your questions till after, and then I'll uh, release the chat so you guys can um, post them and she'll do her best to answer all of them, okay? Uh, you know the rules. If I have to throw you out into the, um, in, back into the uh, waiting room, I will. So make sure that you respect our guests, okay? All right, thank you. And uh, here you go, Jennifer. All right, well, Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. As was stated, I am Jennifer Scott Williams and I work for NASA at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And I'm here to talk about the International Space Station, as it says here in the title, a cool place for science. So this is about the International Space Station. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the ISS as we call it, but I've got a few videos in this presentation. Hopefully they you know, play well, but if they don't, I'll just keep on stepping through and I'll give you the verbal information about it. So let's see if we can get this first one to load.
A bridge above. So the International Space Station is a bridge above in many ways. Not only is it a bridge above the Earth, right? It's our opportunity to conduct research and do very other activities in the microgravity environment, but it is also a bridge across. It's a bridge across cultures. It's a bridge across countries, nations, agencies, disciplines. So the International Space Station is a bridge in very, very, very many ways. So just a few tips, a few numbers to share with you. The International Space Station has been in orbit since November 2nd, 2000. And that's since most of you have not have been on the earth that long, right? So as long as you have been alive, there has been a presence, a human presence in space 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365, 66 sometimes uh, days of the year. We have always in your lifetime had someone living and working in space. Over 200 people have visited the ISS from over 17, actually, probably at this point it's about 20 or 21 countries. It flies at 17,500 miles per hour. So you can't even feel it. It's so fast. It's run by 52 computers and it is covered by a hundred racks of software, equipment, science, all kinds of things on the inside. It's powered by over one acre of solar panels. So about the science, this is what I care most about. We have literally flown over 3,000 experiments to date, closer to 3,500 experiments. And those experiments have been conducted, led, run, executed by over almost 4,000 scientists around the world, from various countries around the world, well over 110. So how big is it? Well, if you've ever been to a, foot, a professional football stadium, then you will know that it is a pretty large venue, right? So if you've ever gone to a professional football game and you look down at the field, imagine you're sitting in the stands and there's an international space station sitting in the middle of it. That's how big the ISS is. From end to end, it spans the length of a professional football field. It has a habitable volume of a five to six bedroom house. And at any given time, we can have anywhere from six to 11 astronauts living and working on board. So a little bit about me, who am I? Um, I am Jennifer Scott Williams. I have worked at NASA for about 21 years, almost 22 years, and I have worked in various roles uh, at NASA, mostly at Johnson Space Center, doing different activities. I graduated with a bachelor's degree of science from Spelman College and a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Once I started working at NASA, I decided maybe it's a good idea for me to get an advanced degree. So I went back to school and ended up graduating from the University of Houston with a master's degree in Electrical Engineering. So am I just a nerd? No. I own the fact that I'm a nerd, but I do like to do other things and losing my hobbies. So I love to bake. I like to run when I can. I love to travel around the world whenever I can. So COVID was really painful for me. And I love to volunteer in my community. So NASA is not just about people who do science and STEM and all that kind of stuff, but we like to do other things as well. So my journey. Wow, how did I get here and what was that all about? What was that like? Well, I was raised, born and raised in the military. So I was born in Oklahoma, but I was raised as an Air Force dependent. And what does that mean? It means my father was an officer in the Air Force and that meant we moved around a few times. That was kind of difficult for me because I am a natural introvert. And so moving around to brand new environments in school was a challenge for me, but it definitely served me well later in life. I went to school in Washington, DC as I was a young child 
Then I went to school in Dayton, Ohio for like middle school ages. And I finished out my high school career in Florida, Panama City, Florida. And from there, that's when my college experience began. So that's where I entered as a fresh woman at Spelman College, one, my first alma mater. And then I matriculated through the Atlanta University Center dual degree engineering program in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech or the Georgia Institute of Technology. And as I mentioned before, I went to grad school at the University of Houston. So in doing that though, um, going through school, going through college, I honestly never expected to land at NASA. I really thought I was going to go to school to become an industrial engineer or really what my passion was at the time, especially in school and grade school was fashion design. So I thought maybe if I get an engineering degree in like textile engineering, that would lead me toward this sort of fashion industry. But it turns out I went to a course, maybe, must have been maybe a junior in high school it's called Minority Introduction to Engineering at Auburn University. And I went to a particular class where they were doing work on breadboards. And so it was an electrical engineering class. And the end product that these students were working on was making lights dance in sequence on the breadboard. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And so that was my trajectory as I have to do electrical engineering. So that's how I ended up becoming an electrical engineer is just that little spark of interest. Um, but I am still interested in fashion, but I'm, I've had a very fruitful career um, thus far. But in school, I, I thought that's what I was going to do. I ended up pivoting. The NASA came to um, the Atlanta University Center to recruit. And so I figured, well, that might be a good opportunity, right? Maybe I'll go to NASA for about five years, get that on my resume, get a little bit of experience, and then go somewhere and make some real money, like on Wall Street or something like that. Uh, it turns out when I arrived at Johnson Space Center, it was a lot of cool things that I could do. So I became a space shuttle flight controller. The space shuttle was retired a little over 10 years ago, um, but that was my first experience at NASA working in mission control of operating systems on board the space shuttle orbiter. And since then, it's just been a wild ride. I, I do not regret the decision to come to NASA, and I've been here literally ever since, like over 20 years. So what's a research portfolio manager? So my current job is the manager of the applications client support office. And the applications client support office is composed of research portfolio managers. Essentially research portfolio managers are like the customer service entities for research on the International Space Station. So if you have an idea, if there's something that you want to try to do in microgravity, some kind of science experiment, or if you just want to fly something in space, our team of RPMs, research portfolio managers, can help you do that. So we help scientists, we help students, corporations, even commercial entities. We've had partnerships with Adidas and Estee Lauder. We help those entities fly things in space. It is one of the coolest jobs I've ever had. So what's the path? The, once you decide you want to do something in space, then you have to find a sponsor and then you have to find funding. And so you can do that in various ways. And our RPMs help those entities figure out the best way to do those things. Once they get the money in place and once they get a sponsor in place, then we figure out how to make it work in space on the International Space Station. And so there's all kinds of criteria that we have to meet, all kinds of procedures that need to be conducted in order to make sure that your experiment is successful. So what is a research portfolio manager or an RPM really do? Well, we do all kinds of things. We attend conferences around the world. We travel for meetings and collaborations, and we work with what we call payloads. So when your experiment is developed and designed, 
it then becomes a payload. It becomes an investigation or something that will be done or conducted on the International Space Station. And as RPMs, we are often responsible for helping the teams, the payload developer teams or PDs prepare for launch. And so that end picture on the right hand side of the screen is me in one of the labs several years ago, helping one of our payload developers prepare some self science bags for a launch to the ISS. That middle image is a few pictures of me doing some international travel. Uh, I've been to Russia as well as Japan for some of the work that I did as a research portfolio manager. And that first picture that says attend conferences, we have an ISS research and development conference every year. It was virtual for a couple years, of course, during COVID, but I've also, I've been found giving presentations or being the MC for some of those activities at the ISS RDC, what we call it. So what's work life like? It can be very interesting. So I've flown on the zero G aircraft, I've simulated microgravity, I've rode, ridden in the Mars rover, um, I've conducted meetings with our center directors and even our NASA administrator at the time, and I've been to our neutral buoyancy laboratory. So you see that little picture of me standing next to what looks like an astronaut. We have a humongous pool here at Houston that helps astronauts practice their EVAs, extravehicular activities. And so we often have an opportunity to go over there and see what the astronauts are doing when they're doing their training flows. So just a little bit about the visiting vehicle traffic that goes to the International Space Station. It is so, so busy. We've got a SpaceX Crew Dragon. We've got the Russian Soyuz. We've got the SpaceX Cargo Dragon that only takes hardware and different supplies to station. We've got the Cygnus vehicle, Japan HDV, Russian Progress, and we are developing the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser, which is gonna be a new spacecraft that's loosely based on the orbital space plane that was developed, oh gosh, must have been two decades ago. And we're also working to fly the Boeing Starliner or the CST-100. So lots and lots of vehicle traffic that we have to manage on a regular basis to take crew and cargo to and from the International Space Station. Who's on board right now? So right now we are in what's called increment 69 and we have expedition 69, the expedition 69 crew on board. That's composed of those gentlemen that you see right there in the right hand image. The most recent addition to the crew is crew six and that is on the left side of your image. So those crew members, Sultan, Warren, Steven and Andre, were recently launched to the International Space Station in February, and they will stay on board for at least three months. Usually it's three to six months at a time, um, the astronauts and cosmonauts stay on board. So the Expedition 69 crew is the full complement, and you see that right now we have seven crew members on board. When we do crew rotations, and that's when a crew set a new set of crew come on board and another set of crew leaves, Sometimes that overlaps. And so earlier I said, you can have up to like nine or 11 people on board. That is often during a crew rotation period where you've got a crew that has come on board and then you've got a crew that's getting ready to come back home. And they're just kind of in this waiting period until we can get the vehicle traffic and the launch and landing opportunities just right. What we're working toward right now is our second private astronaut mission. This is something that is brand new in the world of NASA and human spaceflight. We have given or provided the opportunity for us to go commercial with our spaceflight and we can have commercial astronauts. And so for the Axiom 2 crew, this is our team here. You've got Peggy Whitson, you've got John Schaffner, you've got Al Carney and Barnawi. So this is also the first time we are flying individuals from Saudi Arabia to the International Space Station. So on the slide prior, I talked a little bit about Sultan. 
He is our first crew member from the United Arab Emirates, UAE. So we are definitely expanding our reach in terms of allowing um, people from various cultures and countries to come on board the International Space Station to do science and commercial activities. Our Starliner crew is getting ready to launch probably later this year on the Boeing Starliner CST-100 vehicle. And these are our crew members right here, Fink, Wilmore, and Nicole Mann. So living on the space station, what do astronauts do? How do they function? How do they work? All of those things. I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse into that. So you can see here in the upper left, he's got a sleeping bag and he's kind of strapped to a cot. That's how you sleep on the ISS. You basically find yourself a place to strap down and you figure it out, right? There is no up or down. There is no ceiling. There is no floor because you're floating. And so when you have several crew members on board, you can sometimes find them in the CASA, which is like a crew quarters, small like zip up crew quarters. You'll find astronauts there, but sometimes you'll find them strapped around just with their sleeping bags, wherever it makes them feel comfortable. They eat and, and work, well, usually they just eat in the galley. And whenever they're eating, they have to rehydrate their food because it's very heavy to launch. Like re launching regular food is a very heavy and expensive thing to do. So what we do is we have team members here in Houston that work with the astronauts to create a menu of their choosing. And I hear they eat really good. Um, so they create a menu of their choosing and then that team, the, the team of people that work in the food lab, dehydrate the food, send it up to space. And then when the astronauts are ready to eat, they go to the galley, which is where you see Victor Glover here with the little drink bag, looks like a Capri Sun. They go to the galley to refill or rehydrate their food, their dinner or every meal that they wanna eat. And they also have to exercise, they bathe, like just all the things that you do here on earth every day, astronauts have to do in space. And so we figure out many ways for them to do all of the things that they need to do while they're on the ISS. All right, so working in space. So you can see here, we've got astronauts in various locations on the International Space Station doing some work. So in the upper left, we have an astronaut that's harvesting veggies in their veg unit. And we've got on the upper right, an astronaut working in what we call our life sciences glove box. That's where we do a lot of our hazardous kind of um, science if, if we need to do that. And then we've got uh, in the lower left, astronauts preparing for an EVA. So you've got your EVA suits that are in the uh, airlock. And in the bottom left, you've got an astronaut that's preparing to work with what we call the cold atom lab, and that's in the US lab. So what I'm gonna do, I've been talking for a little while. I'm gonna take a little pause. I'm gonna stop sharing and then bring it back up. But if we have any questions, I can entertain them for just a couple of minutes. I'll take a quick pause here. Okay, chat's open. Someone asked, how is it like in space? I, I, don't, I don't think we can hear you, you're muted. Oops, sorry. <laughs> how, how is what like in space? I don't think she's gone to space. Did you say you? Go no, on. I've never been to space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. She's never gone to space, Brisa. Uh, Kira, she asked, would you be able to have a pet if you always travel <laughs> to space? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yes, I could still have a pet if, because I, even if I travel there, there are plenty of us at NASA that 
have pets and we still travel quite a bit. So yes, that is possible. <laughs> All right. Hey, what is your favorite part about working at NASA? This is Mason. Oh, that's a really great question. So my favorite part of working at NASA is working with all the teams to enable their research on the ISS, um, to see their faces when they are getting ready to launch. I saw my very, actually, I've been at NASA 20 years and I had never seen a launch in person before because I was always working. And so um, just being able to see that happen and see the science go on, on board and into space and get executed on board is, is really exciting. So yeah, th that's the best part is the people. All right. And Wall, uh, he, he or she, I'm not sure, uh, who operates the International Space Station? Oh, that's a really good question. So the International Space Station is actually what we call fly by wire. So it's run by computers. We have people here on the ground that send commands to it that help operate the systems on board, but the entire ISS is run by itself by computer. Yeah, Brandon, you can unmute to ask a question. That was his question. <laughs> oh, that was his question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and ask. Brandon. Okay, we're going to go until he gets himself together. Mary, okay. she asks, it seems you are consistently doing interesting work. Is that what keeps you there at NASA, the projects? Yes, actually it is because I had no intention of staying. <laughs> I thought I was going to go off and do something else and be a millionaire or something like that. But every time I turn around, there's always something interesting and new to learn and do. And I've been able to just go places that I never imagined I could go and, and interact with people and do things that I just really never thought. I'm working in mission control was amazing. And so just knowing that I can do that and interact and interface with astronauts and hear their stories, share their stories is phenomenal. So yes, I keep finding interesting things to do. So that's why I never leave. <laughs> but I do have a few more charts. I wanted to just take a little pause mm -hmm. there because I can go on and on. Yep, and um, we have like 30 questions in queue. <laughs> so Eric, Eric, we're, you're next. I, I didn't okay. forget, uh, Eric is next afterwards. Go ahead, Eric. All right, I'm gonna put you guys back on mute for the chat. All right. Here you go. Okay. So we'll, we'll start back with Eric once I finish this up. I, I will not keep you much longer, I promise. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight into um, the different research facilities that we have on board. So each major international partner has its own laboratory. So the US Destiny Laboratory is right down here at the bottom. And then we've got our Columbus Research Laboratory, that's ESA or the European Space Agency that's right over here on the side. We've got the Japanese experiment module, the GEM or what they call Kibo, which is right over here on this side. It's pretty long. It's got the pressurized module right there on top. And we've got the Russian research facilities, which are right here at the back. So we've got quite a few research areas that we can work within on the ISS. So why do science in space? What's that all about? Well, the International Space Station is a microgravity, microgravity laboratory. It's built for the purpose of doing science in space. And so I've got one more video for you just to illustrate that. Let's see if it works.
So that's really it. We are doing microgravity research to advance our exploration efforts. The things that we are learning on the International Space Station right now will help us as we prepare to go back to the moon. Last week, we announced our Artemis II crew. This is the first crew that will return to the moon in over 50 years. And so we are trying to prepare them for the journey. We want to make sure that the research that we do on board ISS informs us of things that we need to work on here on the ground so that when we do these long duration space missions with humans on board, we can sustain them. We can make sure that they are safe and they're healthy and strong enough to execute the missions far, far away. All right. Let's see what else we have here. All right, let's see. That's uh, actually it. So if there have I have any other questions, we yeah, can roll we, right along. Let me go see where we, okay, we stopped and Eric was next. It, and uh, he mentioned, is it hard to sleep in space? You probably could answer without <laughs> being Yeah. Yeah. Um, from what I hear, the astronauts um, find it kind of difficult. It's kind of hard to get used to it at first. But just with all things, as you would need to adjust, right, whenever you sleep in a new place, like if you go on a trip, or even if you go to your granny's house, right, or your grandpa's house, it's an adjustment at first. You're used to having your own things and being in your own bed. Um, but once you are there for a little while, then you're able to adjust and you're able to function and you can kind of get past that initial scariness. Um, so yeah, it is kind of hard to sleep in space from what I hear, at least at first, and then you get used to it. Good. What other questions? We have um, from Tammy. What did you minor in during college? Oh, what did I minor in? Um, I didn't actually do a minor. I just stayed within my majors. It was hard enough <laughs> to do mathematics and electrical engineering. I really didn't have a whole lot of time to do anything else or try to minor in anything. Um, I definitely tried to sharpen up on my Spanish skills, but really just wasn't time to do much more than my core studies. Okay, Wesley. Do you know when ISS, uh, ISS was made or when it went to space? I think she answered that early on, so you may not have been here, but go That's ahead. That's right. Yeah, so the International Space Station really had its beginnings in November of 2000. So this uh, International Space Station has been in orbit for longer than you've probably been alive. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. How much is one space suit? <laughs> oh, gosh. You know what? I could find the price for you, but I'll say that it's in the millions of dollars. Um, we actually have a new design that is being that's being put forward. We've got the Artemis crew suit that is being revamped and designed for the astronauts to go to the moon. We do have our launch and entry suits. We have our EVA suits. So there are a whole lot of suits made for space flight for different phases of flight. Um, and each one of those suits is tailor made in some way for each astronaut. And so they can get pretty expensive. Wow. Tiger, would you want to go to space? I thought about it. I did think about it. I, um, cause once you get into NASA, it's like the possibilities are endless, right? And when I did my first few space shuttle missions and mission control, I realized I've got it really good. Like I can do the space thing in the daytime and I can go home and go to my own bed at night. So I kind of like that. I don't want to have to be away from my family and be floating above the earth, you know, 24 seven. I like my creature comforts. <laughs> so <laughs> eh, I've lost interest in wanting to go to space at this point. All right. Aiden wants to know, what do you drink in space? Well, a lot of water, a lot of hydration drinks. Um, that's, 
really it. We, <laughs> we've had a few experiments on board that are um, like alcoholic beverages, but I don't think the crew is allowed to consume that. So they're still actually on duty even when they are in space. So I don't think they've had the opportunity to, to try those things, but it's mostly water and like Kool-Aid kind of drinks, hydration drinks, Tang. Well, I'm probably, I'll probably find that drink in Tang, but <laughs> any kind of liquid beverage that helps keep them hydrated. All right. Ashley wants to know where does space begin? That's a good question. So what we consider space to be is low, well, we consider low earth orbit to be right around the 200 mile mark to start right at the 200 mile mark. But honestly, one could say that space starts right at the earth's atmosphere. And that's not far from here. That's, you know, what, maybe hundred miles or something above the earth. So it's not that far. And so, but what we consider low earth orbit is somewhere in the area of 200 to 400 miles above the earth. Kind of like where the satellites are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have satellites in low earth orbit. We have them in medium earth orbit, which is called MEO, um, GEO, which is 22,000 miles away. So we have satellites all over the place. That's why when you look at the earth from um, a satellite's perspective, it looks like a whole bunch of dust. Those are all the satellites that orbit the Earth. All right. Jane wants to know what other jobs are there at NASA? And that is a very loaded question because I imagine that there are hundreds of them. <laughs> there are tons of jobs at NASA. <laughs> and um, what I tell people, because I also do recruiting on behalf of NASA, what I tell people is if you can imagine it, if you want to do it, if you love doing that, you can probably find your spot at NASA. We have, we have space literally for lawyers, um, doctors, teachers, um, engineers, scientists, budget analysts. If you have, if you're really into money and you want to be like a financial accountant or anything like that, we've got those. We call them procurement officers because we got to have people that can go out and buy the hardware. And so we've got contract officers, um, pilots, military people. I mean, you name it. If you can imagine the job, there is a job available for you at NASA. All right. Uh, Kingston wants to know, is it hard to breathe in the space station? No. So the space station is calibrated to be at the same PSI, the same pressure and the same environment as we have here on earth. So we have special mechanisms called the environmental life control system that sets the environment of the space station to be that that is similar to what we have here on earth. Great, that was a good question. It was. When Mary wants to know when you when you were doing the flight simulation, did it make you want to fly aircrafts? Um, so when I flew on the zero G flight, I flew as a guest. And so I had a unique perspective. I wasn't there to conduct an experiment. Like a lot of the times we um, fly zero G aircraft for people to practice doing their research experiments because it allows you to be in microgravity for something like 30 seconds at a time. Um, but I didn't have that. I was a special guest. So I got to play. <laughs> I was out there turning flips and doing selfies and stuff like that. Uh, so no, I wasn't interested in flying the aircraft. I wanted to play and I still am not interested in flying the <laughs> aircraft. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Hannah wants to know why do astronauts work in space? Well, astronauts are employees of NASA or the various agencies or entities which they are a part of, right? And so just like we have here on Earth, you know, working in mission control or conducting um, simulations or 
things like I do, helping to create the research complement that the astronauts are going to do on board, they have a job to do. They have to maintain the International Space Station. So they're cleaning toilets, just like we have to clean toilets here on Earth. They're fixing the canisters, what we call, we exchange lyo canisters on board, which helps cleanse the environment. Think of it as maybe like a HEPA filter, right? Um, they do our science experiments. They are our hands in microgravity. So they actually learn about the experiments that need to be done and they conduct those experiments so that we can get those results on the ground. All right. So Zoe has her hand raised. Do you have you want to ask a question, Zoe? Yes. Um, is there any regrets that you ever have about working at the space station? Do I have any career regrets? Um, no, absolutely not. I was actually just talking to someone about that um, maybe a few weeks ago. Every single decision that I've made in my career has been intentional and on purpose. And I have zero regrets of anything that I've done in my path because it has propelled me to where I am today. Good question. Good. Excellent question. Okay, Antra. Um, make sure I say it right. Is it Antra or Antra? Uh, Antra is okay. Okay. Um, so how old do you have to go to be able to go to space? So that's a really good question, especially now that we have the opportunity to fly commercial astronauts. Um, typically astronauts are like older than 30. Um, there's not really an average age. We've got older astronauts and we've got younger astronauts, but I would say the, the typical profile of an astronaut is one that is of course college educated. Um, most of the time they have a master's degree or higher. Um, there's extensive training that's involved. And so our average age, I'm just gonna guesstimate is probably 30, 35. Um, maybe a little older than that. So is there a required age or a minimum age? No, I wouldn't say that. It's really about whether or not you can meet the qualifications. Okay, thank you. Ashley, you have a question? Um, yeah, I just want to know if you guys think if life exists outside of the solar system, so does life exist outside the Milky Way? Well, we have some thoughts about that, yeah. Um, and we have individual scientists that study um, far deep space atmospheres and planets. And um, we are looking for those planets that may be similar to Earth and have a, a habitable environment, right? And so I would say that there are individuals at NASA that do believe that there is life and life forms outside of the Milky Way, or even in, the, in our solar system, inside the Milky Way, but in our solar system, outside of our solar system, excuse me. Thanks, Ashley. And Danica, you have a question? Um, hi, is there a chemistry facility in NASA? A chemistry facility? Um, yes. Yeah. There, there are all kinds of chemistry facilities. I should probably clarify. So NASA has 10 centers across the nation and they are scattered about in various states. So we have two NASA centers in California. We've got Ames and Armstrong research centers. And we've got a research center here in Houston or this is a space flight center in Houston. We've got a space flight center in Florida called Kennedy. Um, we've got a few space flight centers on the Upper East Coast, like Goddard, um, and headquarters is located in Washington, D.C. We've also got a NASA center in Cleveland, Ohio, um, called Glenn. We've got Langley in Virginia. Um, I mentioned Goddard already. And then we've also got um, an affiliate center called Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and that's where a lot of our deep space activity occurs. All right, thank you. Kingston, how do you have a question? Um, wait, hold on, I forgot my question. 
Okay. Think about it and come back. Yes. <laughs> Brandon, you have a question? We can never find Brandon. I'm not sure. <laughs> I see you all. Brandon's hiding. Yes. <laughs> I have a Brandon. You acting like him right now. <laughs> all right. Uh, Brandon's off mute, so maybe it's your mic or something. But we're going to go on to Matthew. Matthew, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, like, what does NASA want in, like, people they recruit or, like, work for them? Very good question. It really depends. It depends on what the hiring manager is looking for, right? So, for me, when I'm looking to hire someone into my branch, I am looking for someone that is adaptable, that is flexible because space flight is hard and getting research done on, this, on the space station can be hard and it changes all the time. So you have to be flexible in being able to do your work. You have to be really good with people. Um, have a decent personality because I said earlier, my team is sort of like the customer service representatives for the ISS. So when you call us, we have to be able to help you get your research done on station. Um, the degree actually for me doesn't really matter. Uh, for, for my office and my work, it's good to have a nice diverse team. So I have engineers, I have scientists, um, from all different backgrounds. And so for me, it's most important that you are adaptable, a quick learner, can follow instruction and have passion about what it is that you're doing. Good question. All Very right, question. Sophia, you're up. Sophia. Okay, I'm gonna lower her hand and go on to Aiden. Aiden, you have a question. How long do astronauts have to train before going into space? Excellent question. So astronauts, a typical training path for an astronaut is about two to three years. So from selection as an astronaut candidate, um, Sure, well, they also call them ASGANs, but as an astronaut candidate, you come in um, once you're selected from the pool of over 5,000 applicants. Um, I think it might've been 10,000 the last call. Um, once you're selected, then you have to go through rigorous training in all systems of the ISS and as well as become a T-38 pilot. You have to be able to fly the planes. And so it takes about two to three years to do that. And since it's the International Space Station and you'll be staying on board for three to six months, you have to learn Russian. It helps to learn some Japanese as well. Um, maybe a little bit of French if you can, but Russian is required. So it takes a while. It takes a while for you to train as an astronaut, sometimes longer. Now you see why they're all in their 30s, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've gone, gotten their degrees. A lot of them have had careers before they were selected. Um, so, yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, happy Lee. Okay, hi. So, um, what's the most important characteristic do you think a NASA worker needs? Yeah, some of the things that I mentioned earlier um, being adaptable to change being flexible, um, being a hard worker, like um, we as civil servants anyway, are few. And so um, we always have more work than we can take on. We always have more things that we have in the you know time of the day to do. So I would say just having that flexibility and that passion is definitely, those are some good qualities to have. Good question. Tiger, I'm trying to get through. We have about uh, six minutes left, guys. I'm going to try to get around to all of you. Go ahead, Ty. Is it fun working in the ISS? Is it hard, you said? Is it fun and hard? Oh, yeah. Well, as far as I've heard from the astronauts, yes, it's both. Um, one of my friends, um, Christina Koch, who just got selected to go on to Artemis II, she is like the best personality. And she said that when she went up to the International Space Station, 
she said she loved it, loved every minute of it. And as soon as she came back, she was ready to go again. Wow. Okay. Okay, Alexander. Uh, do you know how to how they get oxygen onto the space station? Right. So we do have um, a system, the environmental life control system, that helps generate all of the proper gases that you need for life, right? So um, just like here on Earth, we don't just breathe oxygen. It's a mixture, it's air. So we have systems on board that help um, create that environment or generate that environment. Okay, Jaden. Yo, can you like drink out of a water bottle on the space station? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Jaden. <laughs> <laughs> Bridget? Um, what advice would you give for a future NASA scientist? I couldn't hear Say her. One more time. Yeah. Say it again. Um, what advice would you give for a future NASA scientist? Oh, what advice would I give to a future NASA scientist? Wow, um, that is a really good one. So I think it's just going to be the same qualities of any NASA employee. Um, have a passion for what it is that you do, especially, actually, especially if you're a NASA scientist, because depending on what area of study you're in or what work you're doing at NASA, it could be challenging. A lot of the scientists that I work with are always looking for funding for their research. And so they're always applying for grants. They're always looking for that funding and sponsorship that I was talking about before. And so be diligent, stick with it. If it's a passion that you have, stick with it, cultivate it, and always, always be ready to learn. They're always learning something new, like every day, so. All right. I think that, Angie? Um, what is the work culture like at NASA? Another excellent question. I'll say at Johnson Space Center, which is where I work, um, the culture is very family friendly. So just about everybody I know has a strong work-life balance. Like they've got kids at home, um, they are active in the community. We have something called VCOR here um, at Johnson where you can go and volunteer for different events. So the final four was here um, in Houston. And so we had a whole NASA contingent out there doing volunteer work. So you could actually participate in the events. And you can volunteer on behalf of NASA. So we have a lot of outreach activities that we participate in in our community. Um, we have extracurricular sports, softball, softball teams, all kinds of clubs. And so um, it's very family friendly at Johnson and uh, many of the other centers as well. So the culture at NASA, it can be stressful, especially when we have a lot of changes in our flight planning. But Generally speaking, it's a very supportive environment. Good question. All right, we have a we have room for a couple more, but if you guys have, if we didn't get around to it, send uh, uh, the ones that are in Mr. T's class. Give me the questions, send him the questions, and he'll give them to me. Okay, and then I'll ask our guests. And she'll get back to you as soon as she can. She's a busy lady. All right. So um, I, I saw Hannah, but she's gone now. Um, okay. Hannah, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, because I you so you were at the top, but now you're at the bottom. So I'm going to let you go. Go ahead. Oh, uh, what is the average salary for an engineer working in NASA? Ooh, that is a very interesting question. Um, the average salary depends. It depends on if you are a civil servant, and that means that you work for the federal government. Um, it depends on your years of service. 
It depends on your educational background. So if you just have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, um, and it also depends on whether or not you are a contract employee. Mm -hmm. So contract employees outnumber federal employees roughly three to one. So anytime you go to a NASA center, odds are you're gonna be talking to someone who does not work for the federal government. They work for a contract partner. And so their salaries range and I, it's, it's, it just depends on the things that I've said, the years of experience and all of that. Um, I would say the GS-13 pay band is probably the most common for federal employees. And that runs somewhere in the area of $85,000 a year on the high end, ballpark. All right. Okay, one more. I'm gonna let you go, Sean. Okay, Sean, after you, I'm gonna do my closing video. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, are you there? Okay, let's move real quick to Kingston. Is there anyone that you admired or looked up to? Oh, that's a very good question. I actually admire and look up to a lot of people at NASA and outside of NASA. Um, our current center director, Vanessa Weish, she kind of rose from the ranks. You know, she started off as an engineer at NASA and then worked in various offices along the way. And I met her when she was a manager, I think, in the um, Maybe it was a space shuttle program. I actually don't remember. It's been a long time. I met her a long time ago. Um, she might have actually been in engineering at the time. And very sharp lady, knows her stuff, so kind. And now she runs the Johnson Space Center. And so I definitely admire her. Um, I admire my friend, Christina Koch, that I talked about earlier, who's an astronaut and has flown in space before and is about to go to the moon. So I think that's really amazing. And um, I admire my dad, who really inspired me to become an engineer in the first place. So there are a lot of people in and out of NASA that I admire and respect. So that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, that was a good question. Okay, guys, um, okay. we're going to let her do her Last. <laughs> and uh, we can, you guys can enjoy your Friday. Okay, this is it. So I talked a lot about the International Space Station, but there's so much more. I also talked about Artemis. Um, ISS is going to be in orbit until 2030. That's only seven years left of the International Space Station program. So what's next? What are we going to do after that? Well, let's see. I've got a little video here, hopefully to play for us. Uh-oh, what happened? And with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and share with you all. I hope that you were inspired to learn a little bit more about space and microgravity. And thank you for the outstanding questions that you asked this evening. So the International Space Station is a bridge above and a bridge to our future. And we look forward to working with you all to get it 
us there. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. That was such an excellent presentation. And we hope you come back in like six months from now when we do our rotation, because I, you know, NASA is like one of my favorite topics. I don't know. <laughs> so I tend to skew space all the time on these, but I just, I had more fun than the kids did, believe me, but um, we appreciate you taking the time out. Now you guys can say that you know somebody from NASA and you've talked to somebody personally. So I, we really appreciate you and we appreciate you kids, you know, because on a Friday after you've been at a week of school, that's mm -hmm. an awfully, and, and we got over 60 of you online. So we really appreciate you taking the time out. And um, come visit us again, Jennifer. I'll be in touch. And um, you guys have a great weekend, all right? Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night. All right. Thank you.